And I'm going to go ahead and get us queued up for three. But before I do that, if you recall what the generally what the topics were for the first two videos, do those, does everybody still remember what we watched last week? About homosexuality and that sort of thing. So again, our focus is this is the Genesis, the first part of Genesis, and the first section was just on the idea of creation in general. Did this come out of chaos? Or does it have the appearance of order? I like the circle. We're talking about what qualifies like as life, and so let Donna in here. Um, so just as a review on that. When I say take it back over there to Papa. if something is alive, or what is what are qualities of something that's alive? Can move independently. That was one of them. Right. Can reproduce. Can reproduce. And there's one more I know. <coughs> But the last one they referred to was the ability to metabolize, to take oh, to take something and turn it into a source of energy. Okay. Hey, hey, what's Papa building over there? He's building a dinosaur. T today, the third um, today the third installment is going to be um, looking at. What is man? So we'll go ahead and start that, make sure we have plenty of time to talk about it. Let me get it rolling here. Here's the fun stuff. Let me share screen. Let me optimize the audio for sharing. Let me know when you guys can hear this. <clears throat> Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Wondered, where do we come from? Hear it. Have you ever had trouble yes. wrapping your mind around the idea that the earth is billions of years old? Or that humans have only been around a fraction of the time? Are humans intelligent animals at the top of the food chain? Or are we more special than that? And whatever we conclude that we are, uniquely humans or highly evolved animals, where did we come from? And are we here for a purpose? This is Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. The mystery we want to unlock right now is where did we come from? Not just you and me, but all of us, humankind. How did man begin? In the last episode, we talked about the origin of life in general and how it developed into more complex forms like plants and animals. This time, we're gonna make it all about us. What are we? And how did we humans begin? And what makes us human? For sure, <laughs> scientists answered this question with a worldview of science that was dominated by a biblical view of origins that God, the designer, made man in everything we see. Scientists and theologians were not far apart on their thinking. Often, the theologians were the scientists, and vice versa. In the 19th century, that began to change. We've all heard of Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species. In it, Darwin argued for evolution of life from simpler forms to more complex ones. But he stopped short of saying that apes evolved into people. Four years later, in 1869, Thomas Huxley took that step 
and suggested that mankind also evolved and came from lower level primates. His book, Evidence as to Man's Place in Nature, detailed this theory. His central thought was that anatomical similarities between humans and apes made evolution likely. Then, with that line of evolutionary theory already crossed, Darwin wrote his own sequel, The Descent of Man, now applying evolution to humans and contending that humans evolved from primates. From these authors came the basic assumptions of evolution. First, that all of life evolved over long spans of time. Second, that any differences between us are the result of natural selection and some adaptations and mutations along the way. Finally, that similar design means that we must have a common ancestor. We would expect that if we all came from one common creature way back when, then those creatures closest in line with us would have similar anatomy. So, let's see if that's what we find. It was Huxley who looked at the similarities between humans and primates, which everybody else, in addition to Huxley, was seeing as well, and assumed that because we were most similar to them, therefore we were probably most closely related to them, and that notion has been perpetuated right up to now. We find that, yes, of course, um, chimpanzees are bilateral animals. They have two arms, two legs, two hands, two feet, and that sort of thing. But there is a lot more specific details that separates us from the chimpanzees. Today, we have more sophisticated ways of determining the genetic makeup of an organism than by merely observing its external traits. Mapping of the human genome started in the 1990s. By 2003, researchers reported to have completed sequencing on the entire human genome, as well as some plants and animals. Genetic research continues today, and geneticists and other scientists are discovering new ways to apply this information to everything from disease therapies to genetically modified food crops. Although our understanding of how DNA works is growing exponentially, the basic principles of genetics are still the same. DNA is a macromolecule found in the nucleus of nearly every cell of every living thing, and it tells the cell what function to play. The DNA is packed tightly together into large units called chromosomes. Inside the chromosome is the heredity information that is passed from generation to generation. This information determines your physical attributes, like your hair color, how tall you might grow, your ethnic characteristics, even whether you will lose your hair. And on the most basic level, your DNA carries the information that determines what kind of organism you are. The key to what we are biologically, whether we are a person or an amoeba or a chimpanzee or a gnat, is written in the DNA. It's the blueprint of what we are. You may remember from science class that a DNA molecule has a double helix structure that looks like a twisted ladder. The latter's rungs are made from four nucleotides known by their initials G, A, T, and C. They pair up with each other all along the DNA strand. An easy way to think of it is this. The DNA strand is made up of these four letters. Those letters make up words. Those words make sentences, sentences, paragraphs. In this case, genes are the sentences and chromosomes are the paragraphs. The letters and the sequence of the letters are what determine what the organism is. From these letter combinations, you can make something complex like uh, an encyclopedia or a human. Or you can make something relatively simple like uh, a stop sign or yeast. When a geneticist sequences the genome of an organism, the result is an extremely long chain of letter combinations. So, when geneticists are comparing the DNA of two different species, they are comparing where these letters match and where they don't. So, if Huxley and Darwin's theories from the 1800s are correct, and we all have evolved from a common ancestor, today's scientific evidence should corroborate that humans and their animal ancestors share similar DNA. And that's what some scientists say they find. 
So there's a very common belief out there that humans and chimps have evolved from a common ancestor. And so many times even humans are considered primates. Okay? And the reason for that is they say, well, you know, if you look at the DNA, humans and chimps are 98 to 99 percent similar. That's what you hear in the media. That's what you hear by many scientists, unfortunately. But it just is not the case. Everyone hears that the chimpanzee genome is 98 to 99 percent similar to humans. Human. But what does that mean? Well, this is an area I've been researching for the past four years. And the one thing that I've found out is that these estimates are based on isolated segments of DNA that we share with CHIMP that are very similar. It's not based on the whole genome. So, for example, a lot of the DNA that supposedly is the same between chimps and, and people would be for something like metabolizing foods, breathing in air, which we call respiratory physiology, and the various processes that not only chimpanzees and people have to undergo, but also mice and rats and all the other vertebrates in the world. We all have to digest food. We all have to breathe in the same air. We have to drink the same water. So therefore, so much of the genetic material would necessarily necessarily have to be the same. The human genome was sequenced first, and it took a very long time, and it took a lot of money. And the analogy that I like to use, it was like a giant jigsaw puzzle, okay? Because when you sequence human DNA, you don't get the three billion bases all in one, one nice strip, and you know how it all goes together. It's like doing a jigsaw puzzle without a picture to go by. You don't know what the final picture is supposed to look like. Well, when they went to do the chimp genome to save time and to save money, and based on the evolutionary uh, assumption that humans and chimps share a common ancestor, they simply took the human DNA as a, a template or a scaffold, and they just lined up the chimp DNA with it. Now, is that really how the chimp DNA goes together? We don't know. And so there's just no evidence to support that humans and chimps share a common ancestor. There's 900 million DNA letter differences between us as a species and chimpanzee as a species. That's a huge difference. At 1% of our sequence, we're 98% similar. Well, overall, we're 70% similar, and practically that means 900 million letter differences between us and our supposed closest evolutionary relative. And the differences are too vast for evolution to work for us to evolve from a chimp-like creature or a primate. It's just not possible. The genomes are that different. So perhaps the genomes of chimpanzees and humans are not as close as we're led to believe. And as to those comparisons in anatomy that led Huxley and Darwin to contend that humans evolved from apes, let's take a closer look at the evidence. Humans and animals have a lot of similarities. There's no doubt about that. But there are also a lot of important differences between humans and animals, and particularly between humans and chimpanzees. There are a lot of physical differences, which you can see in external anatomy, the body hair, the ability to pick and grab things with your hands. The humans have a specific muscle in their forearm, which gives them a unique capability to manipulate the tip of their thumb, which a chimpanzee doesn't have. And because we have that ability, we have a lot more creative ability with our hands. Why does it matter if genetics proves that modern man evolved from chimpanzees? When it comes down to it, it's the difference between believing that humans are complex animals versus believing that humans are humans. It's not just the external physical capacities that you see that make us different. Clearly, there is a major difference between humans and chimpanzees. And let's just jump to some of the obvious ones. Humans put men on the moon. Humans build hospitals. Humans use surgical instruments and operate on each other. Humans uh, play baseball and go to ballets and write ballets and write poetry. Humans do all of these things because there is not just a vast difference between us and a chimpanzee intellectually. Beyond the physical, there are emotional and intellectual differences between humans and animals. A Labrador retriever, for instance, has been bred to favor the genetic disposition to fetch. He can be taught the command to fetch a ball. Or he can be taught that fetch means sit or roll over and play dead. The dog doesn't understand the meanings of the words fetch or sit. 
He's merely been trained to respond a certain way to a certain command. Right. A chimpanzee can be trained to use sign language to ask for a banana, but he can't put together a sentence about something more abstract like, tomorrow I want apples. An African gray parrot has a vocabulary of up to 3,000 words, but the parrot is mimicking sounds. She can't construct meaningful, complex sentences from those words. Secular scientists try to explain the differences between humans and animals in terms of evolutionary development. But the Bible has a much simpler answer. See, while God created thousands of kinds of animals, he only created two humans. This doesn't mean that animals don't have emotions and intellects. Oh, they most certainly do. But only humans were created in God's image. So when we look at humans, you know, it's... <laughs> It's really interesting because even the simplest things are extremely complex. And one of the examples of that is the blood clotting pathway. Um, obviously that's very important to us. So when we get a cut, um, the blood clots and we don't bleed to death. And when you look at how that happens, it's a chain reaction, so to speak, of many, many different proteins or what are called factors that are involved. That the end result, one kind of activates the next one, which activates the next one, and the end result is a blood clot. So by definition, the blood clotting system or the blood clotting pathway is irreducibly complex because it's made up of many different parts. And if even one part is missing, if even one factor is missing, blood doesn't clot. Those types of systems, those types of complex biological systems or irreducibly complex systems are very hard for evolution to understand how those things came about because all they're really left with is mutation and natural selection. Those are the main mechanisms for Darwinian evolution. And natural selection, well, it only selects from what's there. It can't create anything either. It can't account for the origin of novel things or new things. It can only select or call, so to speak, from, uh, the, from the proteins or DNA or whatever it may be that's already there. So random mutations and natural selection, they can't do what evolution needs them to do. Well, as Christians, it should really matter what our view is on the origination of human beings, whether we evolve from an ape-like ancestor, as is told in the evolutionary story, or whether we believe what the Bible tells us. Now, I want to make one thing really, really clear, and that is the difference between human beings and animals does not boil down to biology. We are not just more sophisticated animals. Humans are humans and animals are animals. That's not to say we don't share many characteristics with the animals on this planet. Our bodies are similar in many ways. Most mammals have two eyes, two ears, one nose, and one mouth, because God created that design for functional efficiency. But sharing similar features doesn't mean we're related. What makes us different from animals? One thing is, of course, our intelligence, and especially our ability to have the kinds of conversations that we're having now. Thoughts and ideas about life and its meaning. This is something very human and very unique, something that no animal shares with us. And it turns out that man's desire for meaning in life is what the Bible has said all along. One of the earliest statements about people in the Bible is Genesis 1:27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God put Adam and Eve on earth to manage his estate, to hold dominion over the earth. All the plants, all the animals, all living things he entrusted to us. So did God put humans in their current form in the Garden of Eden on the sixth day of creation as Genesis tells us? Or did we evolve over millions of years? Our oldest life forms accidentally sparked into being from a primordial soup? Let's take a final look at this question by looking at a few of the problems with the theory of evolution. Three points to remember as it relates to evolution. First, none of the major steps of evolution have ever been recapitulated in the lab. So whether we're talking non-life to life, 
or that first molecule to the first cell, or a bacterial cell to an animal cell, or single cell to multicellular creature, or jellyfish to something with a backbone, fish to land, you name it, any of those big transitions. Never been recapitulated in the lab. Second thing is that evolution happens too slowly for us to observe by the evolutionist's own admission. So when we're talking about the essence of evolution, what Darwin's really proposing, humans came from some ape-like creature. We never see any changes on that scale. We're talking about speculation about the past. We're not talking about real observations in the present. All we see is small changes. So that's the second big picture point to consider. And third, Darwin gave a test for evolution. He said if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not be built by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Roughly paraphrased. So he's saying, I'm trying to explain all of life. And if you find something, some species, some, some part of a species out there that you can't build step by tiny step, then my theory is a failure. The inner workings of the cell, highly interdependent, complex, you remove one component, system collapses, you can't evolve the cell. The cell makes up all life on the planet. So by Darwin's own pen, evolution should be rejected. So does it seem more likely that humans are uniquely made by God? That we have a special role to play here on Earth? Look at our magnificent ability, not only to think like a dog would think, but to think intelligently and symbolically, to think of the future and to imagine things beyond the here and now, the intellect to understand and the courage to explore the unknown. And what about our ability to feel empathy for others, to give of ourselves and help others with no earthly reward, except knowing that it's the right thing to do. Consider for a moment our ability to create works of art, to write poetry, to sing, to dance. You know, as God's creation, humans are also unique in that we have a spiritual life, a connection to a perfect creator who has endowed us with responsibility for the whole of the earth. And that connection is God's desire for companionship with us. Now let that sink in for a moment. God made both animals and people, and animals are precious to God, but we humans are the only creatures that are created to have genuine, intelligent, compassionate fellowship with God. And here's the best part. This companionship, this fellowship with God, it's not just made for our statistical 72 years of life. It's intended to last forever. If there is a God who says that he made us and made us in his image, then our purpose becomes clear. Being made in God's image creates the potential for fellowship with him. What Jesus did to provide salvation restores the fellowship. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. That's the source of meaning now. And it opens up an eternity that has a resolute future. I'll leave you with this. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians the very same idea. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Doesn't that excite you? For his good pleasure. We bring God pleasure. Doesn't that boggle your mind? That's why he wants to be with us. And this should encourage us to soar in this life, empowered by a genuine relationship with God as part of his purposeful design that gives each of our lives meaning. And the key to understanding this, and even more, is to dig deeper into our origins, turning over every bit of evidence. Next time, we'll turn over the fossil record and see what mysteries we can unlock there. Until then, I'm Marcus Lloyd, and we're unlocking the mysteries of Genesis.
All right. Thoughts, questions, comments? It seems, <clears throat> it just seems like, I, I don't know what the mindset is, but it seems like, you know, there's just been on the part of those that have the evolution mentality, it's, it's like a, a forced thing, like almost trying to make it um, without thinking about all of what they just, talked about but I guess the some of those were before there was more advanced um, scientific ability to understand the intricacies of all of that yeah I, I think that's one of the interesting things that jumps out at me <laughs> to be honest I um, had the chance um, well one of, the, one, of the, one of the people we met along our podcast journey that Alexis and I have met, a guy who now participates regularly in the, uh, in the show, he's actually a, um, he's a physician in Kansas City, and his area of research is in um, the application of genetics. He's a clinical geneticist, and he's a really nice guy, really bright guy, and the, the first episode that he, that he really did with us was on the mapping of the human genome, they were you know, going through that process. And so in talking to him on that episode and before that episode, and even subsequently since we've talked about that, just what a big thing that was. And the thing to realize is, you know, as was mentioned there, that happened in the 1990s and took until the early 2000s. And in some way you would argue that it's still going on. It's, it's still going on. Yeah. Th th there's like, I, I think if I remember the number that, that Eric told me, there's like 180 to 200 base pairs that there's, that are still just elusive. So it's not done. <laughs> We're mostly <laughs> done, but it's not done. But understanding that that's only something that uh, scientists have had access to in the last, what, 20 years in some way, shape, form, or fashion. You go back to, uh, uh, the recognition of DNA, the double helix, the uh, click, and I can't think of the other guy, scientist's name. That's what the 1940s, 1950s. So to your point, Donna, all these things that have come along that scientists now know were not just not known to Darwin, but they were a whole two generations after Darwin. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, what he was observing was he was observing external things right? Um, and had no clue about what was going on in some cases in the chemistry or at the, the microbiological <laughs> level. I mean, all of that was a complete, you know, um, mystery to him. And so when he, when he makes assertions, you see the pictures that he showed, for example, were like, you know, the shapes of of a primate and human skulls, you know, and, and making the connections there, the, you know, two eyes, one nose, um, you know, one mouth kind of uh, connection. And all of that is very superficial and very external. Have you done any research or is he going to go into the Cambrian period uh, next time? Do you have, have you advanced your studies on this particular topic to that point? Uh, he, they're, they're going, there's a, there is a whole, one of the things that's on going into like, um, well, the next one's going to be on the fossil record, but they actually address dinosaurs in particular in the various, what are those eras and epochs? I forget which or which uh, when I, um, that's the part of science I didn't pay as much attention to, but they're going to cover some of that stuff. Good. Yeah. And as far as I know, science has no idea how life began. They yeah. cannot create it. They have no idea. Right. In fact, that that um, that was actually talked about a little bit last week in the in, in the in the first one that we did, which was. In fact, one of the more common theories now, because they can't justify anything else, is where, well, it just came from somewhere in space. And so it's just, 
Yeah, you know, that, that's the multiple universe concept too. You know, eventually you got to come down to how did it happen? Right. This uh, universe, the next universe, 50 million universes, you know, how did it happen? Right. I agree. And, that, and, and to me, that's the, you know, one of the interesting things about that, you know, just conceptually is um, they don't know. So they put off to some other unknown as long as that unknown is not God. You know, it, it can almost be any unknown as long as the un, the unknown to them is not God. Um, which I think That's right. Is an interesting part of that. And and that brings us to, in my view, why I I'm going to be dealing with an atheist a friend of mine before too much longer than this month or next. In reference to, he's convinced that I'm totally and absolutely an idiot and they have no idea what I'm talking about. And that may be true to some extent, but uh, I began to wonder, I, I gave him a whole bunch of books and references. He wanted the scientist uh, that uh, would explain uh, my position. And I gave him all that information. And, but I came to the conclusion some time ago that he really doesn't want that. I think he really wants to be, uh, uh, he, he wants to be known. He wants to have the uh, somebody uh, pay attention to him. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, I don't see that he has any really good logic. He's very bright, but I, I don't see that that he's fighting off the concept of God because of science. I think it's just because I'm not so sure he wants that concept. Yeah, you, you have to, you have to once you acknowledge his existence, you have to acknowledge several other things. Exactly. That you're subject to them. <laughs> That's right. Right. And there are boundaries. And I'm not sure that some of them want to explore those boundaries or, or have boundaries, rather. There, there's a term that's come up in this. It came up in a couple of the videos last week. I know it will continue to come up because it's an important part of this discussion. Did everybody hear the term irreducible complexity? Right. Yeah. Uh, just want to talk about that for a second, just to make sure everybody has a good grasp. Of that. By the way, good morning, Diana. I forgot to say hello when, when you when you when you logged in. I'm glad you're here. Good morning. Um, is is everybody clear on what irreducible complexity means? The fact that you bring it up makes me think that we probably don't, because I I'm the complexity. Obviously, it's not simple. There's there's many parts there's many ins and outs and irreducible complexity I probably am kind of at this level when it's probably so many levels deeper okay for understanding so I think it's worth me just mentioning here before I launch the next video we'll do that so that we cover mm -hmm. two irreducible complexity is the complexity part means that there's more than one thing to it it is complex the irreducible part means you can't make it less complex than this. This is as, this is, if you're thinking about simplifying a fraction, which is how I heard this expressed once, you know, okay, you know, um, four eighths is the same thing as two fourths, but eventually you get down to one half and you literally can't reduce that any further in the ways that we think of using whole numbers and fractions. That, that's, as, that's as reducible as it gets. And when I talk about something that is irreducibly complex, particularly in biology, is that you can't, it has more than one element to it. If it didn't have more than one ele element to it, it wouldn't be complex. But it's one of those things that if you remove any of the elements, be there two, three, five, ten, it no longer functions that way. This is the lowest common denominator of how it functions. And so the example that was given in this video was blood clotting, which I don't understand how that works. Kathy can probably all give us a story on how that works. But what I understand, there are these factors. I know somebody who has uh, ch children that are hemophiliacs. I know. She could do a better job of, <laughs> of explaining the, the, the factor factors. cycle than I could. But I know from hearing her talk about her kids being treated, it's about they're missing some of these factors, which are the things that trigger this process. First, this happens, then that triggers this, then this triggers that. But all of those are necessary or else the clotting process doesn't happen. If you remove any one of those things, 
the other way to think about it, the other, the other thing from the fraction thing that I've heard is think of it as the house of cards or blocks or whatever. You can remove any part of that, the rest of it as a process collapses. And so one of the things that's going to come up time and time again, that's a challenge, and they mentioned it here, for those that want to tout for evolution is when you have, let's just say, three things that all have to work together to make something work work that's its irreducible complexity all three of those have to appear interacting at the same time because if you only have two of them what do you have you don't have it and so for example they talked about this last week i guess they were talking generally about dna rna and proteins those are irreducibly complex the RNA by itself needs the DNA. The DNA needs the RNA. Proteins are the, are the methodology. If you don't have any of those parts, you don't have a DNA-based life system. That is irreducible complexity. And more than anything else, when I read about this and studied this, I think this is the most, to me, the most powerful argument to somebody who is scientifically minded because this is what argues for a creator. <laughs> The creator brought all three of those parts together in the way that they work together. And in fact, in some instances, some of the things I know they're going to cover through this, one of the parts by themselves makes no sense at all. It wouldn't even wait around or be there for the other one to somehow evolve. And so you're going to hear that term. I thought it was good just to stop and make sure we understood what that was. I think they do explain it each time that it's used, but they don't always stop and do that. So when they use the term irreducible complexity, they're talking about something down to its, it involves more than one thing that's down to its least complex form. You can't reduce it less than that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. If you take a one leg away from a three-legged table, it won't stand. It's not a table anymore, right? And, 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 if, and if it all, firewood. it's firewood. <laughs> it's and, and if it always only had two, it never became a table, right? Yeah. At a minimum. Yeah, that, that's a good. That's a good. That's a good practical analogy in terms of you know what, what's the minimal requirements. Uh, you've got to have. In fact, I can't think of anything other than leaning against a wall or doing something else. I can't think of anything that other than a, than a bipedal, you know, creature like a human, who um, who can stand a, a, a two-legged table will never stand unless it's leaned against something. Some really big feet. <laughs> But even there, it, that, that's expanding its, you know. Yes. All right. We're going to go to the next one, which is called buried clues. So I'll get that rolling here. Let me do this the other way. It's a little bit easier to make it work this way. The beauty, the mystery. History of the earth. What secrets lie beneath its surface? What clues has it left about its past, about our past, I can see that about where here, right? we come from and how we got here, and when? Fossils are the only hard evidence that can help us understand what life existed in the distant past. Could the stories we've been told about the distant past be a miscalculation? More importantly, why does it matter? What do the remnants of the past tell us about the direction we are headed? I'm Marcus Lloyd, and welcome to Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. As science and technology advance, we're discovering that the ancient text of the Bible contains more truth in it than we've ever imagined. In this series, we examine the evidence from geology, astronomy, biology, and other fields of science to see if the data supports what the Bible says about our origins. But where besides the Bible do we find answers for the really big questions? Ones like, who am I? What am I? How did I get here? 
Can science really provide answers to the deepest questions of life? Well, there is a way of digging up the evidence and finding the truth. Today, we've come to Dinosaur National Monument to explore rocks and fossils, to learn what secrets they reveal and what the science really means. Many dinosaur fossils, like this bone of a sauropod, can be found here, but there are lots more. In fact, dinosaur fossils are so abundant here that this exhibit hall was built around a huge rock wall containing approximately 1,500 dinosaur bones. Let's check it out. Yeah, I want to go there. Some fossils. Pictures have a way of telling the story of our lives, whether it's a family album or a pic you send your friends. Fossils are kind of an Instagram, a moment in time captured and posted on the page of Earth's history. But what are fossils? And what do they really tell us? Fossils are kind of a freeze frame in time, a snapshot of the past that gives us a glimpse of life, prolific life that once populated the Earth. But does it explain the origins of that life? Well, can a snapshot of your life explain who you really are, how you got there and what you did? What does a fossil snapshot actually reveal? And how can what's missing reveal everything? Is somebody wanting to know where this is? Yes. It's in Utah. Okay. Field trip, Sunday school field trip. Sound like a field trip. One of the main tools evolutionary scientists have used to promote evolution has been the fossil record. All the fossils which lie buried in rock formations in the sedimentary layers or strata of the Earth. As you go deeper into the Earth, the normal assumption is that you go deeper in time. There are 23 layers of strata here in Dinosaur National Monument, many of which expose fossils that provide a glimpse into this hidden past. When you look at which fossils are buried in which layer, you supposedly get a picture of how life evolved from the simplest organisms buried in the deepest layers to more complex and recent organisms like dinosaurs. Most evolutionists believe that this process is a very slow and gradual one. Since change would have happened very gradually, there should theoretically be transitional forms in the fossil record that show a major body change between primitive versions of an organism and more complex versions, such as the creature that's somewhere between a fish with fins and an amphibian with legs. Let's investigate one of the more famous examples. Darwin was uh, pretty, uh, pretty frustrated at the first publication of The Origin of Species, and he was hopeful that there would be evidence to support his theory. They hadn't really dug deeply into the fossil record uh, by that point, and so they were all looking for hard evidence that would support his contentions. And so Archaeopteryx was hailed as a wonderful find, a feathered dinosaur, a very important transitional form between dinosaurs and birds. So there are things we know about Archaeopteryx that cause us to question it as a true transitional species. Dinosaurs were all over the planet. We find their remains all around the world. If Archaeopteryx was the progenitor to modern birds, why is it only found in Germany? Why isn't it found in deposits all over the world? Um, the other important thing is that uh, true modern birds have been found in strata older than the strata that Archaeopteryx came out of. So if it is the true progenitor to birds, why are there modern birds buried deeper in the fossil layer than Archaeopteryx? But what exactly is it? Evolutionary scientists still can't agree. Is it a reptile with feathers or a bird with teeth? Can it only be interpreted as a missing link? What does this fossil or any fossil actually reveal? It all depends on how you look at it. We all tend to have our favorite scenes from films. It could be an action scene, maybe a funny scene, or even a romantic scene. For some, they just love the last scene of a happy ending. 
But you can't keep watching the same scene from a movie and expect to know the whole story. So what story is the fossil record telling? Even now, there are some secular scientists who admit that the evolutionist narrative is more than proving a theory of origins. It's a belief system. Dr. Michael Ruse, a world-renowned philosopher of science and staunch atheist, admits that evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. He goes on to describe himself as an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian. And he says and admits that in this one complaint, the literalists are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. So does the fossil record provide an evolutionary picture of the past? Some secular scientists, perhaps unwittingly, have begun to challenge the theory of evolution. Well, evolutionists have traditionally thought that evolution went gradually and that gradually a fish changed into an amphibian and changed into a mammal and, and on up. But uh, where are these transitional forms? Well, Stephen Jay Gould at Harvard was a thoroughgoing evolutionist and a, an expert in the fossil record. Can y'all hear the, the people talking over the music? I'm having a harder time. It seems like the music has come back louder. Yeah, the, it's like the music. I was, make, I was making sure I hadn't accidentally because I was looking where. Well, the, I mean, the music does seem a little loud, but I can still hear them. Okay, I just... He noted that the fossil record really doesn't document Darwinian change. He said, what we find is one type of animal here, and then we find another type of animal here. Now, we know that they evolved, but there's no evidence that they evolved. He proposed a new theory called punctuated equilibrium, that the, the basic equilibrium that we see today in, in life forms, stasis, thing, things staying the way they are. He says, no, that, that equilibrium was interrupted by punctuations with maybe a change in the environment or something, and, and that it happened rapidly. It happened so rapidly that it went from fish to amphibian and left no fossils. The fact is, we find no fossils. The views of Gould, Eldridge, and Stanley stirred up quite a bit of debate among evolutionists. It just goes to show that even evolutionary scientists don't always agree on what the fossils are telling us. Perhaps what they believe affects what they see. So we've come back to this. Here we can see what digging up the past can show us, but what's equally important is what it doesn't show. And how can something that is not there sometimes be more important than what is? Let's put the evidence on trial and see. When lawyers enter a courtroom, they're required to do one thing, fully present their case before a jury. When a jury is sequestered for deliberations, they're required to come to a decision based not on their emotions about the case, but on one question. What does the evidence show? So let's step aside from emotional arguments about science and religion and just take a look at what the facts show and what seems the most logical. Let me present Exhibit A, diversity. The evidence indicates a tremendous diversity of life. Thousands upon thousands of examples of fossils, all preserved with few, if any, sign of decay. How could this happen? Dead animals don't usually turn into fossils. So what forces could have created such near perfect preservation? Well, a very rapid burial of these creatures. So rapid that they don't even have time to decay or end up as a scavenger's dinner. When we look at the evidence, what else do we discover? Exhibit B, stability, or stasis, as scientists call it. There is fully formed prolific life captured in the fossil record, life that shows complexity and completeness. And it's a record from which, strangely enough, the transitional forms of life are missing. Amid all that diversity and complexity, there is no undisputed evidence that shows one species transitioning into another. It seems that what the fossil record doesn't reveal could be just as important as what it does. Let's suppose we want to prove there's been a murder, and we come before a judge looking for a guilty verdict. Well, before you can even come to trial, you have to have actual evidence that there's been a murder. But what if you had no body, no murder weapon, and no witnesses? The jury is duty-bound to go with the preponderance of the evidence. 
If there's no body, no weapon, and no witnesses, the jury would most likely conclude no murder. The case would be dismissed. You see, the evidence we don't find in the fossil record, like decay from exposure and transitional forms, is every bit as important as what we do find. Just like the jury in our dismissed murder case, scientists are also called in to follow the evidence. Without data, all you have is a theory. In every textbook on this, they always produce not only the evolutionary tree of simple going to complex and all, but they also produce a geologic column. The fossils as they're presented go simple to complex, simple one-celled animals down at the bottom and then mammals, man, up at the top. This simple evolutionary picture of simple to complex, it really isn't the story of the fossil record. What you see is complexity at every stage. You do not see this simple to complex change. Uh, that's the story of evolution, but it's not the story of the fossils. The fossils show complexity and design and sudden appearance all along the way. The lowest strata, the Precambrian layer, consists of several geologic eons and contains very few fossils. And then there's a period of time at the beginning of the Paleozoic era where ancient life seems to have simply exploded. The fossil record suddenly goes from showing fossils of relative simplicity to an overabundance of fossils showing great diversity and increasing complexity. This is commonly referred to as the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian layer gives evidence of a sudden proliferation of life forms that were not present in the previous layer. So from the Precambrian to the Cambrian layers, you go from very few fossils to a great abundance of fossils, yet no transitional fossils in between. Where are the simpler transitional forms that should be mixed in this rock-hard record? If they exist, they should be found in rock layers that are lower, therefore older. They're just not there. And if you look carefully at the geologic strata in the Grand Canyon, for instance, there are, according to an evolutionary worldview, huge gaps in time between some of the layers, meaning whole layers of geologic time have gone missing. Either the layers were never deposited or were eroded away. These gaps are called unconformities, and even secular scientists have a hard time explaining where these missing layers went. They admit that the fossil record is incomplete in the Grand Canyon. If Grand Canyon is this stack of pancakes, well, this pancake is dated by their methods, and, and they're thought to be, this is the youngest, this is the oldest. But in reality, they, this one might be 350 million years old, and this is 310 million years ago, there's, oh, there's, what, 40 million years in between these two layers. There's no evidence of streams going through here and eroding a stream gulch, or there's no evidence of trees and their roots penetrating, or there's no worms burrowing, or there's no, I mean, there's nothing happening for 40 million years? So presumably, that's where all the transitional forms have gone, missing in those gaps of time. Or, as suggested by Gould and Eldridge, these evolutionary leaps could have happened so rapidly, at least in evolutionary time, that there wasn't a chance for any transitional fossils to get, well, fossilized. Either way, it sounds to me like no record, no evidence, not much proof of transitional forms. On top of that, there are some surprising new discoveries that have tilted the evidence in favor of a creationist interpretation. The general public is under the impression uh, that dinosaurs lived 65, 68 million years ago. That's what you find in the textbooks. That's what you find in the popular magazines. However, science has really outstripped that knowledge in the last 10 years or so. Why? Because we found soft tissue in many different specimens from different fossil sites all over the world. Uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, Mary Schweitzer from North Carolina State University began working with specimens at the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. And so what they found was a large T-Rex. And they excavated out the T-Rex, and they excavated out the femur, which is the long leg bone. And she soaked it in a weak acid called EDTA. And what that acid does is it dissolves away the bone mineral and it leaves whatever's inside that bone uh, undissolved. And in this case, uh, she found soft tissues. And the, the tech who did the, the dissolution for her pointed out 
I'm finding soft tissue. I'm finding uh, something that's not characteristic of very old bones. And in this case, they think they're 68 million years old. So she had the tech repeat the experiment over and over and over again. And each time it produced this soft tissue. And what she found was actual blood vessels inside this femur that was fully mineralized and encapsulated, which would have protected those soft tissues over deep time. And she found what looked like red blood cells. So using this immunohistochemistry, very sophisticated experiments, she proved the existence of these original biomolecules and biomaterials that go back to the original dinosaur. About five years ago, the Creation Research Society decided to mount a new project called iDino, the investigation of dinosaur intact natural osteotissue or bone tissue. And so we designed this project to go out and find dinosaur bones in the digs, in known fossil digs, to bring them back to the lab, to decalcify them, to put them in that weak acid, dissolve away the mineral, and see if we could find soft tissue inside the bones. On our last day, with only a few hours left, we found the largest Triceratops horn that was ever found on this ranch in the Hell Creek Formation. About 45 inches long, about nine inches in diameter, and it was buried three feet below the surface. We did the decalcification experiment, and what we found is really different from what Mary Schweitzer found. She found individual cells floating in the solution after she decalcified the bone in this weak acid. We found entire sheets of soft tissue. But we thin sectioned this, and we found entire stacks of osteocytes inside this thick sheet of fibrillar bone material. So the question is, how do these very delicate, uh, very uh, specialized molecules and proteins survive 68 million years? Wait a minute. Soft, flexible tissue from dinosaur bone? Now, how's that possible? According to the theory of evolution, dinosaurs walked the Earth over 100 million years ago. Could soft tissue inside a bone really exist for that long? So instead of making assumptions based on what's not in the fossil record, let's break it down and see what is there. 95% of those fossils are marine invertebrates. That's a huge portion of the fossil record. Of the 5% remaining fossils, the vast majority are plants, trees, and algae. Less than 1% of that 5% are vertebrates, creatures with a skeleton on the inside. First are fish, then the rest birds, dinosaurs, and last of all, mammals and humans. Which poses another question. Marine invertebrates in the middle of Colorado? <laughs> Seriously? You know, these fossils are scattered throughout the world and they are amazingly well preserved. What's the explanation? This lowest level, this, this uh, salt mega sequence is called, or the Cambrian layers, sometimes these things go for miles and miles, go across the continent, go into the other continent, go around the world. It's understood nowadays as something happened which caused a inundation of the continent or whatever the land surface was, eroded off that great unconformity, and then began to lay down the sediments on top of that. Those sediments have hardened into sedimentary rock and the dead things have hardened into fossils. So the rock and fossil record is really an evidence of this water-based deposition of sediments that have become rock. Now we're getting a clearer picture of the story the fossil record tells us. There's evidence of a massive mud flow, the instantaneous burial of fossils, and finally, rapid wholesale devastation and death on a global scale. Where have we seen this before? Yes, beautiful. Everything has this rosy glow. You know, appearances can be deceiving. Now, I could keep on wearing these glasses and claim that the whole world is rose-colored, but it wouldn't change the facts. The world just doesn't look that way. Sometimes the way people see the evidence depends on the glasses they choose to wear. I'd rather see the world the way it is. There's a story that matches the evidence we see here, and it comes from Genesis chapter 7. 
And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, cattle, beasts, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth in every man. It looks to me like the evidence and the Bible are telling the same story. But even with the evidence on your side, you'll discover that this is a very unpopular viewpoint, one subjected to ridicule and abuse. But popularity has never had anything to do with the truth. Galileo and Dr. Ignaz Philippe Zimmelweis were two scientists who were ridiculed, even imprisoned, because the facts they discovered went against popular thought. For Galileo, it was for claiming that the sun was at the center of our solar system. For Dr. Zimmelweis, it was for trying to introduce hygiene into hospitals during the 1800s. Both of them were ridiculed, but they were right, and popular science was wrong. Well, we've delved into the mystery buried beneath our feet and discovered the evidence of the fossil record. But the more we uncover, the more there is to know. For example, what about this great cataclysmic event, the one that created the record? Well, that's a journey for our next show. So join me for our next episode as we walk down the road of scientific discovery. Or maybe we should just take a boat. We're a little tight on time, so time for a quick question or two, and then we probably need to pick it up next week. Or comment or two. That spiral with the different periods in it, are there other like versions of that? I'm sure there's multiple versions of it. I've yeah. never seen that before watching this. I was interested when we saw it, this one again. <laughs> and get into those because that's not an area where I'm very strongly like even when Mickey brought up Cambrian I've heard it but I kind of don't understand those periods or like you said epochs or eras or whatever they're called when you hear about the um you know prehistoric or I don't know the different different past period history times. And of course, like any good, you know, eschatologies work this way, we've talked about it before, have a cool graphic. Yeah, that graphic seems to pique my interest a little bit. Almost as complex as the history of the church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if, if only we knew anything about that. Um, yeah. Yeah, because if you look at that graphic it kind of has different visual things to go with it you know like i see a volcano erupting and i see you know a pterodactyl flying and, and things like that and since i'm a pretty visual learner something like that may help me rather than the piece of granite stacked with the name next to it type of thing in the fossil layer and if you even notice on this, because they show, you can see it now, I found it online and pulled it up, but notice it just sort of trails oh, off yeah. into, into whatever that part, you know, wasn't what they focused on. Came from space. <laughs> yeah. Like now I need to know what that, uh, what it actually says down there. I can't read it. Uh, I can't, I can't up enough. blow it up. It, yeah, it, 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 but that pre-Cambrian and then the explosion in Cambrian, like I had never really paid any attention to that before. Those experiments were very interesting on the dinosaurs. I agree. Um, I, I heard, heard recently heard. about that uh, about a month or so ago. Really? Yeah. I, didn't y'all didn't y'all see Jurassic Park? That's what the whole thing's based off of, you know. Let's get some dinosaur blood out of some mosquito and real <coughs> dinosaurs. Mosquitoes trapped in topaz and amber. Sorry. 
And we're, yeah. Okay, now we have two Sunday school field trips once, once we can do it. Uh, we've got to go to Kentucky for the, isn't it Kentucky where the model of the ark is? It was model? Dark, yeah. 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 <clears throat> and then now we have to go to Utah and see the, the dinosaur uh, hill thing. Which is in remote, remote, remote. <laughs> Remote, remote, remote Utah. Yeah. Or we can go to Sherry's and see dinosaurs built out of Legos by Cesar. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So has this been compelling so far? Are you glad we're doing it? It's great. Yeah. Yes, I really like it. Uh, next week we pick up with the flood and um, then getting into the idea, if we get two videos in, the how old is the earth? So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Malcolm out wherever you are.